Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's installment of our Global Perspective Speaker Series. My name is Mark Wynn. I'm a Vice President in the International Group here at the Dallas Fed and Director of the Bank's Globalization Institute, which organizes this series. Our guest this evening is Richard Fisher, who served as President and CEO of the Dallas Fed from 2005 to 2015. Before joining the Fed, Richard had a distinguished career in business and public service, including terms as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative and Vice Chair of Kissinger McClarty Associates. Since leaving the Fed, he has served on the boards of AT&T and PepsiCo and as a senior advisor to Barclays Bank. In April of this year, Richard was named as chair of Dallas Mayor Eric Johnson's task force on COVID-19 economic recovery. He is also a member of Texas Governor Greg Abbott's Special Advisory Council on reopening. Richard will be interviewed by uh, uh, Rob Kaplan, who is the current president and CEO of the Dallas Fed. Before joining the bank, Rob was a professor and senior associate dean at Harvard Business School, which he joined after a long business career at Goldman Sachs. Before handing the event over to our speakers, let me quickly run through some logistical details. For best viewing experience, we recommend that you use the Zoom webinar application to watch this live video event with audio synced to your computer speakers. If you have technical issues, please feel free to call the number listed in the meeting notice. If you're calling into the webinar from a phone, please note that the video will not sync with your phone audio. We will be taking uh, audience questions during the course of the event and we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to ask the speakers a live question, please click the raise hand icon at the bottom uh, of the control bar to enter the queue. If you would prefer just to submit a written question, use the Q&A button on the same control bar to submit your question to the queue. And we will try to get to as many questions as possible. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Rob. Rob? Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for all the great work you do in leading this along with Jenna Dillenbach. Richard, it's great to have you here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky uh, to be able to follow you in this job. And you've left a great legacy at the Federal Reserve in general and at the Dallas Fed. And it's a really, an, and it's an honor and, and a lot of fun to have you here tonight. So thanks for being here. Well, thanks, Rob. And uh, I feel the same way about you as my successor. It couldn't have been a better choice for the board, and I'm proud of you. Thank you, I'm proud of you too. And I wanna thank all of you we've got, uh, who are plugging in tonight. We've got a great audience. Uh, I wanna highlight two of the audience members, Alexander <laughs> Kaplan and Michael Kaplan. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. We couldn't do this without you. And uh, this is our 36th Global Perspectives event and we're thrilled to have everyone here. So let me get started. So Mark talked about the, the leadership you, work you're doing with the mayor and the governor to help this state and this city uh, recover from COVID. And mm -hmm. um, I guess I'd like you just to talk a little bit, what, what, what have you been doing since uh, the crisis started and what kinds of work are you doing for the, the governor and the mayor? And what, what are some of the big challenges that you're seeing? Well, the obvious big challenge is that uh, when you shut things down, you eliminate jobs. And when you eliminate jobs, you eliminate consumption. And when you eliminate consumption, that means bad news for things that are consumed, restaurants, bars, retail products, et cetera. And the real difficulty here has been to figure out what the trade-offs are because you do want to deal with the fear and the threat of a virus that can kill people. At the same time, when you take people's jobs away or you shut them out or shut them in, you have a, a rise in pernicious effects on mental health, abuse, opioid addiction, and I could walk you through the list. So figuring out this trade-off has been uh, a difficult thing to do. Uh, I, I'm very high on Mayor Johnson. I think he is an earnest, nonpartisan individual. He was a Democratic state rep. I think he has really uh, very carefully sided on the side of what is necessary, which is to great jobs. And particularly given our uh, imbalance in who suffers the most, I'll give you a statistic, Rob, that really is alarming. Uh, over 80% of the homeless population of Dallas, Texas are Blacks, African-Americans, 80%. For the nation, it's around 40. 
And these are folks that were brought into the workforce along with every demographic group, as everybody likes to explain, we're the president of the Federal Reserve. We were soaring along and you pull the rug out from underneath them. And for all these folks to lose your jobs, you lose your economic security, you lose, it's a threat to your family and you become desperate. So the, the effort here has been to figure out how to open the economy and get it back so that we can put people back to work and in turn drive our economy like the US economy or the city or the state through what we do best in America, which is consuming. That's what drives our country. C plus I plus G plus or minus X. Uh, all my 10 years at the Federal Reserve, with all <laughs> models we had, Furbus and dynamic stochastic modeling and so on, to me, it all came back to consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports, and that explained the economy. It took me 10 years to figure that out, by the way, and I'd learned it in 10th grade economics in high school. So uh, this is the important thing. And I, I think, uh, as you saw recently with the advisory task force to the governor, and that's, it's a broad group of people. Uh, I'm on there, Michael Dell, Kendra Scott, you know, people that are actually in the business world, uh, trying to get the right balance here. We recently opened up more, 75%, not bars, but restaurants and other events. Uh, and we had to claw back at one point because we had a spread in COVID, right. particularly as we went through the university graduation season and the holiday season. So now with better medicine, better controls, there's an effort to put people back to work so they can do what they do, which is to consume. That's the basic economics of it. And also when they're back to work, they have their dignity. Nobody wants to be on a government dole. I'm convinced of that. People wanna have a job and they wanna have their own dignity. And I don't care what they look like. So that's what the mayor's exercise has been all about. Now I had a very, <laughs> the Citizens Council really has assumed uh, under their great leadership, uh, what I was originally asked to do by the mayor. My you asked me what we did. First, you had to just get a conceptual roadmap. How do you put your arms around this? Right. We have over a million people, Rob, that work in Dallas. They're not necessarily city residents, but that work for firms of less than 50 employees. They come into the city or they live in the city, live in South Dallas. They were wiped out as things closed down. So how do we get them back up and running? How do we provide them initially with the kind of safety equipment you need, the masks and the gloves and the, the protocols and so on. And now really the Citizen Council has really taken over uh, providing with advice uh, and giving them as much help as possible so that they can deal with the fact that they're gonna have to get their hands on money and they're gonna have to prop the proper accounting systems and so on. Most of these small businesses uh, don't balance their balance sheet and don't have a sense of an income statement. So they're basic educational tools. Right. As far as the governor's task force is concerned, I, I'd have to say this, as you know, uh, before I entered the Fed, I was a Democrat active. I ran for the U.S. Senate with Ann Richards. You check in at the Fed, as you know, one of the greatest blessings is you check your politics at the door. You never go back. And right. I would say this, you probably experienced this, but it saved me a lot of money because no politician ever called <laughs> me, to ask me for another dollar and they still don't. But I must say the governor has been very analytical. There are nights when I get a phone call and he says, Richard Abbott here, I want to go through some numbers with you. He's very analytical and very driven by data, but also, as you know, at the Federal Reserve, data by the time you get it's a little bit old, even though we have better communications now and faster speeds. And he wants to think it through. What does it mean? What's it telling us what's happening at the margin? So I, I'm proud of the state of Texas. Uh, we are a huge community. People forget in the East Coast uh, where you and I were educated <laughs> that uh, we have almost 30 million people in the state. We produce more than South Korea, more than Australia, more than Spain, more than Russia, uh, more than Canada and more than Mexico. I mean, those are a lot, 30 million people who produce and are the job creators in America. And we have to put them back to work. Otherwise, they fall off the deep end. And that's what the exercise is all about. And he has a good understanding. I think, I hope the task force has been helpful to him in getting the right kind of balance. So it, it, you know, we had a situation as you referred to it, where we reopened, we rebounded quickly, 
Right. Uh, we had a resurgence, as you mentioned. There was some, a little bit of uh, tension between the, the governor and, you know, and, and local officials about right. mask wearing and other things. How, how is, has that been sorted out and how, how did it get sorted out? I think it's been sorted out. The mask uh, issue was obviously a very strong touch point, particularly with our uh, Dallas County uh, leadership yeah. uh, and also with the mayor. Yeah. What's interesting is since the governor issued that edict, can't force people to do it, but you be forceful in your expression. Right. There are several state representatives on the far right that want him impeached huh. because of the mask wearing requirement. This is what you have to do when you govern. It's, it's really hard to balance out the forces. And of course, we do have uh, partisan politics involved here. Uh, we try to stay away from that entirely. Yeah. So, uh, yes, you learn by doing. Mistakes have been made. You correct for them. I think the other thing, too, that people don't realize is the way we treat people who are infected by COVID seriously in the hospitals, that's been improved. Yeah. For example, uh, turning them over, not, not lying on their backs. Right. Put more pressure on them. We learned through the practice at hospitals to put them on their stomach. They recover a little bit more quickly. Little things like that come from experience. Just so, as you and I learned through our experience in the financial business, what works and or we think what works and what doesn't work. So if I read the numbers and we get a daily report uh, here and we always pour through it, uh, and Mark Wynn is actually the point person to help decipher this for us, it appears that uh, we've improved substantially on the incidence of the virus, hospitalizations improved. We're a little bit of a plateau right now. Are we reading that correctly? And, and how, do, how do you see the path of the virus up to now and from here? Well, the, I think the, the, the risk presently is we go into winter. When you're in winter, you're indoors. The governor, uh, working with the advisory committee, has opened up manufacturing, for the most part, to 75% restaurants and so on. These are indoor activities. Uh, and that, and we also have university re-enrollments now. Yeah. So there is a risk in the wintertime. And there's one other risk I think uh, I'd just like to mention. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is be careful assuming that once we get a vaccine, it's over. Because most vaccines, statistically speaking, when they first come to market, and particularly one that's been rushed as thoroughly as this one, but the, the proof rate on vaccines that come to market are only 60% effective on average. Hmm. And then as you know, in the state of Texas, but also in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you have the anti-vaccine people. Yeah. And if you go through the math, uh, any large grouping after a vaccine, probably only 40% of the population in that group will be protected. And then we don't know, and the governor's pointed this out to our committee, uh, do you have to have a second round of vaccines? Does the first one be weaker as we test it and see how it works through the population as a whole? Right. So I, I, I am worried that there's this assumption, we get a vaccine, it's over. Rob, we still don't have a vaccine for AIDS after 40 years. All we have are palliatives and treatments, but we haven't solved the basic problem. Now, this has been enormous attention, great government attention all over the world whether it's at Oxford University, one of my many alma maters or elsewhere in the private sector. But I think we have to bear in mind here, this is not easily solved. And meanwhile, we have to go about the business of keeping people uh, safe, but also putting food on their table and allowing them to work. And this is a difficult trade-off. I'm very sympathetic to anybody in government right now trying to figure this out. I don't care if they're a D or an R. Yeah. And I hope that we can get rid of this partisan rancor, because this is yeah. a serious threat to our society. So we, we've been saying to people, even with a vaccine, we're gonna have to be prepared to wear masks and social distance at a minimum through all of 2021 would be our guess. Yeah. Uh, th does that sound right to you? It does, and I, I also think, uh, for example, you and I are, uh, had a good experience of being at Harvard and uh, I seriously doubt having been an overseer, one of the trustees, so to speak, of the university, yeah. that they'll even have commencement next year. Wow. Because you get 35,000 people into that big open yeah. seat. They have. Not worth the risk. Not worth the risk if you assume, say, it's only 40% protected. So we're going to be there for quite a while. I think we're learning how to manage this. We will come up with palliatives uh, and hopefully we'll come up with a total virus protectant. 
but it's going to take time. And meanwhile, the economy has been recovering. Uh, I want to give you and uh, uh, your team a plug because uh, the Dallas Fed has provided data to the governor once a month that brings them up to date and uh, lets him know what's actually going on in the state of Texas. It's the only database that he really feels comfortable with. It's hmm. been very helpful to us, uh, which I then pass on from Pia and her team, yeah. Pia Arenas and her team, and on to the governor. Yeah, this is the head of our regional group, Pia Arenas, that Richard's referring to, so thank you. So um, let me shift gears a little bit, uh, and, and given your, your life uh, at the Fed, uh, <laughs> Uh, what do you, how do you assess the Fed's response uh, to the virus thus far? Well, uh, we saw what happened, particularly in the dysfunction of fixed income markets in March. Uh, part of that was the element of total fear. Uh, I, I've mentioned to you before, Rob, uh, I was in Australia when this all broke out. The first week of March, I was advising Barclays two big banks down there, uh, their clients and the big mining companies in the, in the West. And it was immediately apparent two things were being uh, hoarded. One was toilet paper. <laughs> you couldn't find, literally could not find toilet paper in Sydney or in, wow. in the outwards parts of Australia. And secondly, uh, U.S. Treasuries. So uh, there is a, the reason I mention this is people look to us, to the U.S. economy, particularly to the Federal Reserve and to our authorities in this country when there is fear. Uh, and you know better than I do uh, that the dollar and dollar bonds are viewed as the most precious of things from a safety standpoint. So uh, I would say that presently uh, the Fed did a good job by stepping in and restoring the need to have no dysfunction in the fixed income markets. That was in March. Uh, the equity markets, of course, went through a very rough patch as well. It is important to have financial stability. Most people don't really get that. We went through this in 08, 09. That's a job the Fed has to perform. And you've been very good, as I understand it, in the policy meetings on this subject, because you have that background. The, the negative side is the presumption that there's a Fed put. Yeah. And uh, we struggled with this in 08, 09. Uh, we had a brilliant governor named Stein, Professor Stein from Harvard. You know him from Harvard Business School. I do. Perhaps the finest mind I've ever met, who mm. had an unusual combination of academic talent and brilliance, but also understood how markets work. It's very rare. Uh, and trying to figure out, you know, what were the limits of what we could do. And remember, we went through an experience in 2013 where Bernanke, our chairman, basically said we're going to start weaning uh, from this accommodative policy. And the bond markets went berserk. Right. Uh, and as I like to say then, the feral hogs uh, took over uh, the property at that point. Yeah. So easy to do. The, uh, you know, I think we did back off at the FOMC. Ben particularly backed off fiercely. He frankly was afraid of markets in my view. He didn't understand them as well as people who've been market operators do. He had a yeah. brilliant, brilliant mind. Uh, but anyway, it scared us. And under his leadership, we backed off. Well, I think the trade-off here by stepping in and preserving financial stability is that you give rise to what I call an Irving Fisher plateau. And what I mean by that, Irving Fisher probably was, and even Schumpeter would tell you this, the greatest U.S. economy ever, the economist ever. But if you remember, he made a statement uh, before the crash of 29 uh, that we were on a permanently high price plateau. Huh. And of course, he lost all his money, went bankrupt in the process because he uh. invested accordingly. It's a good sobering lesson for economists, but it also is something that I, I detect recently when you look at valuations in the marketplace. Uh, we have floated the equity markets here beyond reasonable price compared to underlying value. Price what you pay, value is what you get. And the multiples being paid right now of almost any variable are yeah. Uh, very difficult to justify, but also hard to uh, ascertain. There are ratios. We don't know what the underlying denominator actually is going forward because there's so much uncertainty. And uh, you want to have a Fed that's accommodative, but at the same time, you don't want a system that becomes totally dependent on that accommodation. That's the trade-off here. Right. And it's a very difficult thing to achieve and get it right. I'm very yeah. sympathetic. 
So we're in the middle of the war right now. You know, when I joined the Fed, at, you were just leaving and I was coming. We were in the process of, quote unquote, normalizing. And we had not yet raised the Fed funds rate. And we finally did in, in December of 2015. Right. And I learned in this taper tantrum you referred to how hard it is to start normalizing rates. Very hard. Yep. And we were making progress. And unfortunately, because of this crisis, we've gone back. You know, we've had to go back and the economy is even more dependent. Uh, what advice would you give to the Fed from here? Obviously, we have to get through the pandemic and we're not through it. We're not out of the woods by a long shot. But as we get through it, what advice would you give the Fed on how we manage to wean off uh, this amount of accommodation? Well, let's remember part of the accommodation is an expanded balance sheet. We, you all got it down be, below five. It's now back up to seven level. It's growing at 120 billion a month. Right. We had wanted to get, when I was there, Rob, uh, until you came on board, not because of you, but we had decided we're gonna just get out of the uh, MBS, the, the mortgage-backed securities market entirely, because what we were doing is we were distorting the, the price distinction function. And uh, now we're loading that back up Again, so the uh, uh, I, I think you just have to be careful how far you go. I agree with uh, Jay Powell, the chair and the committee, that there's a limit to what the Fed can do. Fiscal policy is critical here. And I think the difficult thing right now, and I, I used to get in trouble with Ben Bernanke on this because I think he got very upset with me, was pointing out that we were in essence sending a signal we were monetizing the debt. And... Uh, this is what modern monetary theory sort of wants you to do. And it's a dangerous place to be. Uh, and as you know, the cost of carry for our US government, given these low interest rates, just tells a congresswoman or a congressman, given the way their brains work, D or R, doesn't matter. I can spend more because the cost of carry is not going up. Right. And so we have a president who's a Republican who's levered the bat wants to lever the balance sheet. He's had an acquiescent upper house and lower house of his constituency with some objection. And we have an opposition who now wants to do even more. I think the difficult part here, Rob, is how much of a role does the Fed play in trying to keep things balanced, preventing panic, providing the accommodations needed during a panic like we're, we have been going through and setting limits at the same time. Right. And I sense and that this is what Powell's trying to express I know him from having sat next to him for three years when we were together, right. he came in June 2012, where he warned the committee in his very first meeting, you know, you're, you're painting yourselves into a corner. Be careful. Right. Because markets are going to come accustomed to this. And then how do we get out of it? Right. Now he's sort of having to face that own pressure of his own criticism back in 2012 in June. Yes. So he is. Uh, I'm very, I'm very sympathetic here. And I, I also want to, I know it's hard to dissent. We can talk about that. But yeah. I think the distinction that you have made, and I hope people understand it, and I hope you explain it further. You did a lot of that today in the media, of uh, being careful that you don't accelerate accommodation as the economy begins to improve, because that leads you further down the road than even what I'm worried about. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. So let, let me, let's shift gears while we have a few minutes before we open it up. You've got an incredible history in trade and understanding trade in this hemisphere and with China. Uh, and obviously before, before COVID, probably right at the top of the list and things we're worried about is the trade situation, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. What, what insights would you have on how, um, how we're positioned right now from a trade point of view uh, globally? Well, um, this may shock our audience here. I actually think, uh, even though I don't like the mannerism and the form of expression that President Trump is correct. And that what I mean by that is uh, you and I and people of our age and most of the academic community still are basing their approach to trade and international and global issues on the Bretton Woods institutional framework. I always have to remind people, the World Bank is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development of Europe. Last time uh -huh. I looked, Germany was pretty reconstructed. France was pretty well reconstructed. Yeah. And we still think of it in that analytical framework. And the reason I want to mention that is 
working for and with Charlene Barshevsky and for President Clinton, I did the protocols for China's accession to the World Trade Organization. Yeah. And it was all based on that framework, that they're going to become more like us, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I confess, horribly naive huh. in the process. We have been taken advantage of. It's a great legal document. They've cheated on every, every single variable. Mm-hmm. And uh, I confess that I was naive and sure. Hope Charlene doesn't mind, mind me saying this, but she was naive as well. This is because we came from a different institutional framework. Yeah. The, the, the WTO is the successor to the GATT. It assumes certain working principles. The Chinese don't play by those rules. The World Bank uh, has spent lending more money for the Belt and Road. They're, they've been smart taking advantage of it. They're not a very big owner of the World Bank. They are head of the HR department, by the way, which I find very Sorry. interesting yeah. in the way they staff it. And the same thing can be said for the IFC and the IMF. We need to consider and have a new framework entirely. I'm hoping that either when this president's reelected or if he gets replaced, that the people that surround them and advise them will lead us into a new path of thinking of a world that's not Atlantic centric, but is indeed Pacific centric. Yeah. And deals with a radical difference between the way the Chinese approach things and we do. And my, my, I'm, this is a long answer, Rob, but I want to it's summarize. Okay. But it's good. Uh, uh, Lenin had a great expression. He talked about control the commanding heights. Well, the commanding heights right now are technology. And what the Chinese are doing, they don't have the infrastructure that we inherit. They don't have credit cards, they don't have copper wires, et cetera. They are able to leap an entire generation into 5G and probably 6G eventually. And the real issue here is who will command, who will have control of the commanding heights of the digital universe? They don't have to operate by a profit. I'm on the board of AT&T. We have to make a profit or else we go out of business. Right. We're developing 5G, Verizon's developing 5G, et cetera. Uh, and um, when you think of it in a way, uh, they're basically following the Amazon model. They're buying market share. Right. They don't have to worry about, they're not making a profit. Uh, they just keep buying and buying and buying market share over time. So there's a, there's a uh, great book out called Blitz Scaling. And I think that's their approach to doing things. And it's not just taking up the ports of Djibouti or buying into the ports of Greece. The average state-owned enterprise in China, Rob, has 15,000 subsidiaries. And that's how the CCP, the Central Committee, operates, not by just owning those companies outright, but also directing the subsidies, sub subsidiaries in terms of where they invest. And they're all over Silicon Valley. They're all over Austin. They're all over us. And we don't even know that they're basically directed by uh, the central Mm. community. So they're very clever. And I would just summarize by saying this. I would be doing the same thing if I could get away with it, given their ideology. They're trying to bring their people out of the middle income trap. Remember, their historic enemies are not us. Their right. historic command, Japan and South Korea, they right. did pull themselves without technology out of the middle income trap. That's the challenge. That's what Xi Jinping wants to do. And if this is harsh, but if you have to lie, cheat, steal to do it, they've been doing it. And it, it, in a way, we've given them the wherewithal by thinking in Bretton Woods terms. So that's a complicated argument. I feel very strongly about it. Would trans the Trans-Pacific Partnership or working closer with our allies have made a would it help with this or the, the, this was going to be challenging whatever we did? Well, two things. One is, I think, given the fact there are historic animus, we need to be working hand in glove with the Japanese, the South Koreans. Obviously, the Taiwanese are a special case. The Vietnamese, who have historic antipathy and have been at warfare with the China, Chinese over and over, and with India, and of course, Singapore. We need to be butching our relationships there in order to be able to position ourselves in the Pacific better. And I hope that will be part of the new framework as well. Rather than just blurting out about these folks, we we need to work with them very, very carefully. So I I do think there's a huge challenge and on the trade front, China's not gonna go away. Uh, This is a, this is, it's not a hot war, it's digital warfare. And we have to figure out a way to outsmart them. And it's not, you're very good on educational issues, Rob, uh, it's a tough one given that we have such poor primary and secondary public education in this country. Yeah. You, when I went to China with uh, Secretary Blumenthal for President Carter to meet with Deng Xiaoping, I was lucky to sit in those meetings. Uh, 
they only had a million college students in all of China and they were all studying Mao thought, which was useless. And they only had a thousand cars in all of China. Wow. This is March of 1979. Wow. Look at what they've done now and how far they've come and how they take the students and focus on engineering, math, uh, bio stuff. We don't do this in our secondary education system and we're not even doing it in the university system very well. Hmm. I think this is gonna be a very long challenge and uh, this is one of the reasons when, when you mature and get gray hair like I did or white hair after being head of the Federal Reserve Bank at Dallas, it'll become even whiter when you start worrying about what's gonna happen on the trade front and what's gonna happen with China. This is not about commodities. It's not about corn, soybeans, pigs. It's about who wins the digital contest. Okay. And that's what we're up against. Good. Now I'm gonna turn it now to Mark Wynn. We're gonna take questions from the audience and let's, uh, let's fire away. Okay, well, this, this one, first one sticks with the uh, China theme. Um, do you think that a new world trade order to replace the WTO is needed? Or should yes. we just focus on bilateral trade agreements? No, I mean, it would be nice to have a broad framework. As I hinted, it's going to be difficult to come up with. Um, most economists will tell you that if you do things bilaterally, you piecemeal the system. This was Larry Summers when we were, when I was deputy USTR and he was deputy secretary of the treasury. Uh, that was his big argument. And, you know, to an extent, he's correct. Although you have to do what you can do uh, to push the other people into agreement. So I, I wouldn't be surprised, for example, and I hope we do end up with a bilateral agreement with the British, uh, if anything, just to help them get through the separation from the, the EU structure. But uh, I would prefer to do a broader framework agreement. I just think it's going to be very difficult to deal with, given the differences between Chinese ideology and our approach towards trade and capitalism. Okay. Uh, this next one is a question that was pre-submitted. Uh, what's your prognosis on total employment levels over the next two years and the likelihood that many of the lost jobs do not come back? Uh, yeah. Are there recommended monitoring fiscal actions that could uh, prevent a large chunk of the population from being permanently unemployed? And how, what do we do to prepare prepare our kids and our grandkids for what's coming down the pipe? Yeah, that's well, a big question. On, on the monetary side, as everybody says when you're at the Fed, and I think it's correct, it's a very blunt tool for going to specific demographic groups and uh, specific income levels. You're trying to lift all the boats, and that's the best you can do. Uh, the fiscal authorities have different uh, uh, powers and capacity. And we'll see what they do in terms of regulatory framework, which also can be done a little bit by the Fed. Uh, community reinvestment acts and things like that haven't been terribly successful, but which we've influenced. Uh, and what they decide, how they decide to direct public spending. I think this is a fiscal issue. But I'm worried about the fact that uh, just as we're communicating here, there's a certain portion of our population that doesn't even have access or can't figure it out. And particularly those lower income groups, hourly workers that have been wiped out, work for restaurants or baggage handlers or work for hotels or whatever it may be, and uh, may not have the capacity to hold on. I, I, I think this is one of the reasons we've seen people take to the streets. It's not just Black Lives Matter, which is important. It's if you're desperate, you're gonna take to the street and you gotta feed your family. You gotta take care of your needs and those that you love. So I, I, I would, again, we know, and you remember from the studies when I was at the Dallas Fed, uh, Michael Cox, and we would look at educational attainment and where you would kick into certain job levels and where you were the most vulnerable. Uh, again, this comes down to educational attainment. And my advice to our grandchildren is you better uh, do well in school and stay up with things because you got to get up into the, at least get to junior college, go to college, get a graduate degree then you become more valuable to society. I, I, I believe the Achilles tenant of my country, of the United States, is our terrible primary and secondary education system. We are graduating kids that cannot read or write, and yet alone perform mathematical functions or figure out how to deal in cyberspace, other than just for entertainment purposes. And I, I really, I don't know how we solve that because school boards are local. Even the governor cannot get certain school boards to do things in our state with his power. The federal authorities have very limited power over our educational system. Uh, so 
this is my biggest fear for our country. And I would just, <laughs> the best thing you can do for your children and grandchildren is to make sure they get a decent education and understand mathematics. And I would argue uh, probability theory, <laughs> probably the most important thing that ever helped me in my lifetime, just to understand the possibility of different outcomes and how you work them. Whoever asked that Very question good. is dissatisfied, but there you have it. Uh, our next question, we're going to try to take a live question, and this is going to be from Gabriel Garcia. Uh, so, Gabriel, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question to Richard and Rob. Thank you. Uh, very interesting conversation. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Fisher, uh, I, I, I totally agree with your perspective about the importance of educating uh, young people. Uh, and, uh, and how significant uh, the digital economy is to the future of the world. Um, and uh, so broadband is, is, is essential to everybody in education. Uh, do, do, you, uh, do you promote the, the notion of giving local governments and school districts the ability to deploy their own private wireless networks or private networks in order to reach students to be able to provide education at a time when, you know, if you don't have a broadband connection, you cannot go to school in yep. this global pandemic. And I'll leave it there. Well, it's a very good question. Uh, I know AT&T and also Verizon and others are trying to figure out a way to provide uh, either cheap or free internet access to uh, different independent school districts, to, for example, the DISD, uh, and working with uh, Hinojosa here in our school district, that is a project that is uh, underway. The question is, how do you uh, finance it? Uh, and can you do it in a way that uh, will sustain it over time? And there also is the question of providing the hardware, the iPads and so on, uh, to the population base that you're trying to reach. Uh, so the hope, for example, uh, of a company like AT&T or Verizon, and I'm seeing this at play as we speak in light of the effort we've been working on with the mayor here for Dallas and with the county judge, uh, is that you will be able to provide broadband communications it can't just be with the students themselves. The teachers have to be able to use the tool and the parents have to be able to use the tool uh, as they guide their children. These are expensive undertakings. And yet I know that big telecoms, including AT&T are looking at this from every possible angle. Now, the federal authorities also get in because you have to deal with the FCC and others to make sure that you're not monopolizing a situation but I fully agree with your recommendation and to the extent I have any voice at either the company I'm on the board of or uh, with the mayor's effort or the school effort, uh, I am fully supportive of this because if we don't have that access, then we can't expect the successor generation to succeed. So it's a great question, uh, Gabrielle, and I thank you for asking it. Uh, next question from the queue, um, probably more directed at Rob. What can the Fed do to improve the Main Street lending program, which does not appear to be achieving its original goals of providing needed financing to small and mid-sized companies adversely affected by the pandemic? So that is a good question. And I would say for all the Fed programs um, where we backstopped issuance in the public markets, there hasn't been that much take up but the, the mere fact of backstopping the corporate bond market and the municipal bond markets caused them to rally so that it's been very uh, easy for companies that are credit worthy and municipalities to issue in size. And we've seen that. The, the, the one program where take up is very indicative of effectiveness is a, is a program like Main Street, which is a lending program. And here's the problem. The problem is this. Uh, it has strict credit requirements, and the banks that participate have to agree that they want to hold 5% of the loan. And the problem is most companies that needed lending when the crisis started, they could go to their banks, they're good customers, and they got it. So what's left are uh, companies that maybe uh, are in certain industries where their credit 
their credit quality isn't as good. And we've been tough on Main Street in that those companies don't qualify very often. And so the only thing that can be done, the main thing that can be done is ease the credit requirements. Problem is it's not a Fed decision. The Fed is lenders, we're not spenders. It's really up to Treasury and Congress to decide that they want to ease the terms because it means more credit losses. And the Fed, I think we'd be very enthusiastic if Treasury and Congress decided to do that, but we need them to make that decision. And until they do, it's very possible that this program won't get that much take up. But, but that's what needs to happen. This is a good example of what I was talking about earlier. Again, it's a blunt tool, monetary policy. As uh, Rob mentioned earlier, it did help. What they say at the central bank is critical. They didn't have to act that much. But to restore the markets, as you pointed out, Rob, and make sure that financing needs could be met in aggregate was an important step. But as far as the specifics, this comes down to the regulators and the law, the lawmakers. Uh, otherwise, you can't force a bank to uh, lend when they don't expect to be paid back. Otherwise, they go out of business and the Fed can only do so much. So uh, I'm fully in accord, Rob, with what you said. And I think it's important for the people to understand when the Fed talks, it, 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 it reverberates through the economy. And that was very helpful at that juncture. Listen, people don't realize if you had to, Richard appreciates this, if you had to price out the market value of the backstop that the Fed provided, I, I mean, my brain probably can't comprehend how significant that is, and we're still providing it, so it's very valuable. But Main Street's one program where we're concerned about it, and uh, it, it'll be worth it'll be worth taking a, a, a continue to look at that and ways to make it better. Can I, can I add one other thing, Rob? Uh, what we learned, I think, through the PPP program, the Small Business Lending Program, the politics that emerged from that and the incriminations and the accusations, I think, also has made people very shy. About, it's not the Fed's fault. It is what came out of the political sphere and the perception people were taking advantage. Maybe they were. But the backlash there, I think, is also sort of constipating this process of getting the Main Street Lending Program up and running. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, uh, another question, probably also more directed at Rob. Thoughts yeah. on corporate leverage? Huh. Well, going into this situation, I wrote we wrote a lengthy paper, as Mark Wynn well knows, uh, where we, we looked at every aspect of corporate leverage in the United States. And the conclusion that came to after looking at it uh, was that it, it wasn't a systemic threat but it would likely be a, a amplifier, uh, quote unquote, an amplifier in a downturn. And what do I mean by that? Corporates are highly leveraged, and it means when business turns down, they're going to spend more of their cash flow to service debt, and it's going to further slow the economy. And that is, in fact, you know, what we've seen happen. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why, in the early days of this crisis. Uh, we saw the corporate bond market pretty much shut down and it was very difficult to issue, even, even at attractive shreds for investment grade companies, although they could issue. And so we had to step in and improve market function. And so I think the main thing we can do with the Fed is talk about it, highlight the issue. Uh, but, but when rates are this low and the cost of debt is so cheap, uh, if you're, you know, it's hard to resist uh, you know, issuing outs. But but I think by talking about this issue, I talked to a lot of companies who decided to term out and where possible deleverage. Uh, and, uh, and we've seen some of that also. But this is a challenge. One aspect, uh, if I can just add a comment here. Please. The, the healthy part about it, for those that have short-term debt burdens, they've been able to take care of these lower rates by pushing out their debt towers, Rob. That's right. And uh, I think a good CFO, almost all good CFOs right now are hell bent on getting that done. Yeah, now, terming out. Terming out. It may push out the problem and postpone the kind of fears that uh, you worry about. But I think it's a healthy development. If you have leverage on your balance sheet, get those debt towers pushed out, term them out so that you don't create and you have better balance over time rather than just emergencies that come up very, very quickly. And, and to Richard's point about the Fed, talk, just talking about it, because remember after we wrote it, we talked extensively. It, it, people did hear it, 
and it made corporate CFOs and CEOs relook. I think it caused people to take a fresh look. Yeah. Another, actually, we have several questions uh, on this related theme, which I know is close to Richard's heart on the uh, also having to do with debt, but this time of the federal US government. Uh, at what point does this become a problem? How do we resolve this? Higher taxes, lower spending, or monetize? Where are the bond vigilantes to rein this in? <laughs> you know, I, one of my first, uh, if you remember, Mark, when I first came on board in 2005, 2006, we did a study about the unfunded liabilities of the US government. That is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And uh, Pete Peterson was doing his work then and came up with a present value, if it were paid off at the time, of $35 trillion. And we came in at the Dallas Fed at $90 trillion. And I, I gave a speech in San Francisco, and I talked a great deal about this, and I fretted about it openly. Uh, that, that's the stuff that was off budget, by the way. Now we have the on budget stuff that is just running out of, out of control. And again, this goes back to the point I made. I think the Fed has to be very careful. Uh, of not being perceived, and it's at risk of being perceived, as monetizing all that debt. Because the inevitable fear is, and we don't see it right now, but every country that's done that has been brought down by hyperinflation and economic mismanagement. So we don't want to have an acquiescent central bank. And the answer is some of these uh, folks in Washington, in the Senate and the House, just got to pull up their pants and be big kids about this and figure out a way uh, to cover those costs. And of course, there is a division in ideology. Uh, one way to cover it is to raise taxes. Uh, the other is to say, well, if we don't raise taxes, we'll have more economic activity and there the tax flows will come. Those are the two arguments that you're seeing. But these numbers uh, are getting to be enormously large. And in a way, we're taking advantage of the fact that there's no substitute for the dollar bond market. The only other deep pool is the euro market. And there's still little bitty doubts as to whether the European experiment really will obtain long term. But where else are you going to go? So we take advantage of it. As long as we have the capacity to take advantage, I believe we, our political authorities, fiscal authorities, should be addressing the root problem. Uh, you're not going to see it in an election year. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I hope at some point we get sensible leadership that will realize we're, we're wasting away a very precious franchise. And if we depend on the central bank to deal with it, uh, I think in the end, we destroy the, the confidence that the world has in the Federal Reserve and our central bank. So, Richard, you'll find interesting on an apples to apples basis, that 35 that Pete Peterson mentioned was yeah. approximately 45 five years ago when I started in this job. And today it's approaching 60 trillion. Yeah. Yeah. And your larger number would have grown proportionally. So we, we don't think this is sustainable. And, and to your point, we're, we're relying way too heavily on the dollar remaining the world's reserve currency. And yeah. God forbid, uh, if that ever changes, we're going to have really our hands full with paying more for our debt. And it's something we should be working hard to protect because it's so valuable, as you described. But I, I, I think we maybe rely too heavily on it. Yeah. Well, this is going to take very brave political leadership. This isn't a matter for the Fed. And uh, I hope we find it. OK, uh, we're going to try to take another question live from the audience from Eric uh, Rachel. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Eric, if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question and please try to be brief. Thank you, I will. <clears throat> um, it's Eric Rochelle. So a minute ago, uh, you were talking about uh, broadband for schools and communities. And so I was wondering what the potential feasibility would be of a Federal Reserve Bank facilitating fiber optic broadband rollout by funding a partnership between the telecom industry and local government with the trick being carrying the network itself, which is the glass in the ground, on its balance sheet. So, so I might comment on this. You know, Eric, you may be surprised to know we've, we've done not quite what you just described, but in McAllen, Texas, uh, the Fed served as the intermediary to put together a partnership between nonprofits, uh, hardware providers, uh, the mayor, uh, local businesses, 
Uh, we didn't need to keep it on our balance sheet. In fact, I was surprised how little it cost. Uh, but we, we, we helped be a catalyst to create that partnership. And now they have broadband in schools in McAllen. I, I think the Fed through our community outreach can play that role. And the truth is there's enough money out there, probably doesn't need our balance sheet. I think there's plenty of people who would be willing to help fund it. The Fed, uh, actually, uh, the Dallas Fed, like the other Federal Reserve Banks, does a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with monetary policy, but supports the communities. And you have to be careful that you don't have a proliferation of new things on the balance sheet that takes away your basic objective. But what you've done in McAllen, what some private companies are trying to do here in Dallas and elsewhere in Chicago and so on, uh, recognizing the need for this is the first step. And then secondly, having people pull you together as you at the Dallas Fed have done in McAllen, that's what it takes. There's plenty of opportunity out there and there's the financial means through the Ely Mossnery world and others. Uh, but that, that is a good example of how you can be helpful. Um, another question from the queue from a former colleague of ours. Uh, what do you expect the impact will be on banks, particularly community banks, from rising bankruptcies and concerns about the future of small business? Rob, you want to take a cut out? Well, so the, the good news is we've got a veteran group of banks in this state, and they've been through a lot. Uh, mainly due because of the energy, real estate crises that have happened. So they're pretty good at, uh, at being careful about credit. Doesn't mean they won't have losses. I think the bigger threats to those banks are, may not be credit losses. They're uh, zero interest rates, so they can't make money on their investment account, and technology and being disrupted by new uh, forms of technology that disintermediate them. I think those are the bigger threats to the banks in, in this state and makes me worried that we're going to see a shrinkage in the number of banks through mergers because many decide because of, again, low rates and technology, this is a little too challenging. I think they're well equipped to handle the credit issues. Uh, and if that were their only issue, I think they could manage it very well, actually. People forget we went through that crisis in the 80s here, which is why we did pretty well in 08, 09. Uh, and... Uh, it is an important subject because if you go, say, for example, take that little 100-year-old bank in Mount Vernon, Texas. Um, they finance the churches, the synagogues, the little leagues. I mean, they are the community, and they buy the local bond issuance, by the way. Uh, you, it, it would be a threat, I think, to the fabric of our society if we eliminate these small community banks. And it's important they stay alive. It is a consequence of monetary policy that they can't make a net interest margin, which is what you referred to here on the low cost of money. And that's one of the costs of accommodative monetary policy. Finding the right balance again is a difficult tool. But I would just say uh, we need to keep those community banks around. And they are the backbone to many of these smaller communities, particularly in the rural areas. And they cannot be replaced by JP Morgan or B of A or whoever it may be. Okay, next question from the queue. Thing, by the way, Mark, uh, quick, Mark. Sorry, sorry. Uh, one of the things the Federal Reserve did do is it, it changed the way that the tests were being made on the stress of these banks and so on, raised the size at which they would kick in on a regulatory side uh, in terms of scrutiny. Uh, and I think that was a good step forward. Uh, after uh, Governor Trillo left uh, that role under the new leadership, uh, of the, we have a formal vice chairman at the Fed now for supervision regulation. I think that's been a big step, Rob, and has been helpful. Sorry, Mark. No problem. No problem. Uh, you mentioned uh, the upcoming uh, conflict uh, is a digital conflict. I assume this is a reference to China. What is your perspective on central bank issued digital currency? And yeah. how important is this going to be going forward? And how well uh, placed is the United States or the Fed uh, for this transition, especially given what the People's Bank of China is already doing in this space. Uh, again, Rob, you should probably give a little update on that. And I, I'm happy to add my commentary. Well, we're looking at it. It's coming. And I think, the, I think the Fed needs to do its work and we need to be ahead of the curve because whether we like it or not, it's, it's, it's coming. And, um, 
and and this is one of this is a potential threat to again to the dollar is the world's reserve currency. So I think these trends are going to emerge. These these trends, which we can foresee, and other technology enabled trends that we can't even imagine right now, those things are coming, and and we need to be working on this at the Fed to make sure we're ready and adapting to it. I think you have to differentiate between blockchain technology and cyber currency. And the key is to master blockchain. It allows you to direct credit, even if you wanted to, in more specifics and to make for a more effective monetary policy. Uh, and the Bank of England has done a great deal of work on this front. But um, it, it, it is an enormous disruptor. And what we've seen so far in the digital currency world is uh, a lot of fraud and a lot of uh, breaking into the system and disappearing money. And that's in the private sector. So the central banks, we always mark, you may remember, and Rob, you know, at the Fed, we're always trying to figure out a more efficient payment system. And when I was had the pleasure of having your job, we had to, for example, close down all the checking. Remember, Mark, we, we had we had to lay yeah. off people because no one wanted to use checks anymore. We were one of the last three check processing center in the Federal Reserve System. Well, that was a payments issue, and this is a payments issue. And how do you grapple with increasing incidence of a technology that makes it easier, but also you have to be careful you don't lose control. And no central bank wants to lose control over the money supply. So that's really the trade-off, Rob, I think, uh, there. And we have to master better blockchain to improve the payment system and make it more fluid. That's what the bank should be doing. I guess, Mark, are we, a, are we, we've got just a few minutes. We're, we're pretty close to time. We've got two minutes, right. Rob. So let me ask, when we ask a final question to uh, Richard, You've been a you've been a leader uh, in the private sector, in the public sector. You've you've been a leader in education, you know what you've done at Harvard and elsewhere. Uh, we have a we have a we have hundreds of people on this call tonight. I think they're listening in because they care about the community, they care about the country, and they want to do things to help. What mm -hmm. advice would you give our audience about things they could do to help? Uh, uh, provide leadership in our community, particularly in this difficult time, and, and provide leadership generally, um, what advice would you give on things that they can do individually? Well, this will sound a bit soporific, but we have to start argue, stop arguing with each other and listening to each other. I mean, we, we have become so harsh in our judgment of people who have different views. And the best thing we can do is listen to them. It's one thing to hear. The other thing is to actually listen. And I don't think we're listening to each other anymore. We've taken such extreme positions. So uh, I think that would be a beginning. And secondly, just the idea of community service. As you know, my family and I have underwritten a lot of community service programs. And this is important. You, you live in an environment where you have to have uh, prosperity or better economic conditions. And you have to take some of your own profit and share it with the community in whatever means, whatever income level you have. Volunteerism is critical. But I, I really would like to see us stop shouting at each other. That would be a very, very good beginning. And let me just add this, Rob, you know this, because you recently dissented in a vote. It's a hard thing to do to disagree after you listen to everybody. But the thing I loved about the Fed and the Open Market Committee is even if you dissented and had a different view and were spoke about it. It's just an intellectual difference after hearing everybody else. To me, that's the model, the way I would like to see society conduct itself. And it was a great pleasure to be able to disagree with people and yet still have them like you in the end. At least uh, I hope they liked us in the end. Yeah, they do like, they did like you and they still do. And they admire the fact that you're willing to stand on principle, but do it in a polite, thoughtful way. That would be the best thing we could do as a country. All right. Beautiful. Good closing note. Richard, thank you for being here tonight. And most importantly, thank you for your leadership at the oh. Fed, in our city, in our country. We appreciate all that you do. And it's, a, it's, a, it's always a privilege to talk with you. And, uh, and thank you for your leadership. Oh, thank you for yours. And I'm telling you, by the time you're done, your hair will be as white as mine. <laughs> all right. <laughs>
and or else you look like Mark. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, that's another uh, God version. Forbid. Uh, and thank you to the audience for being here. We hope you're all safe and well, and I'll turn it to Mark, to Mark Wynn. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. You'll soon receive a survey asking for feedback on this event, and we would really appreciate your candid responses. We hope you'll be able to join us for some of the upcoming Global Perspectives events, which will feature uh, University of Texas Chancellor James Milliken, Bank of Mexico Governor Alejandro Diaz de Leon, and Stanford University Professor John Taylor. Details on how to register for these events can be found at dallasfed.org. And with that, we are adjourned. Have a good evening.